A viewer asked me to talk about what I look for in a vintage pocket knife uh, that makes it a good candidate for cleaning up. When I saw this Craftsman Barlow at the flea market, the first thing I did was ask the vendor what he was asking for it. When he told me five bucks, um, I became interested. I picked it up and I noticed right away that the scales were intact, they were tight, no chunks taken out of them, nothing missing. While I was looking at the scales, I also noticed that it has brass liners. That's a sign of a quality knife. See the brass? I like to open up the main blade first. Now I noticed this one was tight. That's good. Now when you're opening up a blade on the knife, see how the spring comes out of the, out of the bottom of the knife? Now watch when, when the blade's fully open, the spring drops and locks the blade in place. Right? So that right there, that's what I like to call good snap. And the blade's tightly held open by the spring. That's good. The blade also has very little side-to-side -side wiggle. That's a good sign too. And best of all, this blade has not been resharpened much at all. And that's a great sign. Because I'm not good enough to put metal back on a blade. Once someone's taking the metal off, it's off. At that point, I gave the guys five dollars. Let's look at the small blade. It's also very tight. I think it's, I think this knife's quite dry. It needs some lube. Small blade, same way. Looks like it's hardly ever been sharpened. And again, uh, it snaps open real nice. It's tight. No side to side wiggle. So that's what made this a good buy for me. To clean out the grooves for the blades, I like to take a popsicle stick and whittle it down. I made it thinner and I put like a little, little hook on it. Let's see what's in here. There's always pocket lint in these things. And I found worse than that. This one has its fair share of junk in it. piece of metal. Hmm. No bugs this time. Just your normal pocket lint and what looks like the remnants of a chewing gum wrapper. Got some steel wool here. And twist it up. Use the same popsicle stick. Use it to push the steel wool into the into the blade groove. And run it through. Look at all that gunk. See all that gunk it's cleaning out? I'll keep working on that. The blade grooves really cleaned up nice. There was hardly any corrosion in there. That's one of the benefits of the brass liners. And I think those springs at the bottom, they might have been plated. The main blade is actually in really good shape. It's just got some minor, minor rust pitting here. There's more on this side. In order to save as much metal as possible, I'm going to hand sand these blades. 
I've sanded pocket knives with wet and dry sandpaper using WD-40 as a lubricant and I've also used this cloth back paper. This box has five rolls, five different grits from 150 up to 600. I'm going to start with 240 on this blade. I like to support the blade with a block of wood. What's nice about the block of wood gives my knuckles a place to go now. I can push the sharp edge into the wood to protect myself uh, from getting cut while I'm sanding. And most importantly, it takes all the sanding pressure off of the joint. If I didn't have the block of wood and I was holding the knife like this and I was and I was pressing down and sanding, I'm putting pressure on this pivot. By having the block of wood, all the pressure is on the blade. Sometimes I'm able to clean this nail nick out with my popsicle stick, but this nail nick is so narrow. I've got a upholstery sewing needle, and that fits in there perfect. Here's the blade after the 240 grit. I have no plans in removing the metal necessary to get underneath those pits. We're going to call those character marks. Right, now it's just a matter of moving through the grits. I like to pull up a chair and put some music on while I sand through the grits. The main blade is sanded down to 600 grit. It looks pretty good. Now I could I could get out the wet and dry sandpaper and go down to like a thousand or twelve hundred grit. I think I'm just gonna take some super fine steel wool and polish it with that. I think that'll be good enough. The super fine steel wool did a pretty good job. I think that's plenty polished for an everyday carry. Chuck and I will probably go over it with his favorite stuff too. I'm going to repeat that whole process with the smaller blade. Here's a good look at the before. And I'll show you what it looks like once I'm done. Here's the small blade all the way down to 600 grit and then polished with the super fine steel wool. I think that's an acceptable finish for a knife I'm going to carry. Plus we're going to hit it with some uh, 
Chuck's favorite sauce too. I want to clean up inside these letters a little bit. This is one of those special Chinese brass brushes. The bristles are gold like brass. but they stick to a magnet like steel. Neat, huh? These bolsters are in really good shape. I'm just gonna sand them with uh, 400, then 600, and then I'll go over them with that super fine steel wool. See how they look. I think the bolsters look pretty good. While I had the super fine steel wool out, I went over the bottom, the back. I think that came out pretty good too. Chuck and I are going to polish this knife by hand. This is just a piece of blue, blue paper towel. It's getting there, right, Chuck? To sharpen the blades, I'm going to use my Smith's Trihone. It has a coarse, a medium, and a fine grit. For the main blade, I'm going to start with the coarse. This is a, uh, a guide to keep you on the right angle. Rest the blade against that. Try not to put too much pressure on the pivot when I do this. We'll go to the other side. I can feel a burr forming. It's not quite there yet. I like to use the coarse stone till the blade catches my fingernail. I keep working on it. It only took a few more passes. And now it's catching my, the edge is catching my thumbnail. So I'm going to move on to the medium grit. I like to use lubrication on the medium and fine grits. I guess it keeps the stone from getting clogged up. I can almost hear the blade getting sharper. I'll try to focus on the tip here.
I added that honing solution again on the fine stone. All right, let's see how sharp I got it. Shaving sharp. So I think going through all three grits, even with filming, maybe took me like 10 minutes, maybe not even that. And I got this blade uh, shaving sharp. That's not because I'm really good at sharpening or I have a, a fancy sharpening system. It's because these vintage pocket knives with the carbon steel blades are so easy to sharpen. And you can get them razor sharp in no time. I like to use REM oil to lubricate my pocket knives. It's nice and light and has very little odor. Now this knife is super dry. So you're going to see me put way more than you'd want to put right before you put it in your pocket. I want to get those blade grooves lubed too. I'll put some on this blue paper towel. Use that popsicle stick again. Work it down in those grooves. I put some here on the pivot. I'm going to put some on the back springs here. Let that soak in. Now I'm going to close it up and oil it some more. Again, I'm flooding this thing because it's super dry. You would never want to put this much on something you're going to stick in your pocket. I'm going to let that soak for maybe the rest of the day. If it's a knife you're going to store and it has steel blades, I recommend to drop oil and on the blades too. If it's not going to get used. Oh, it's already better. Good. Yeah, it was yeah, it feels really good now. Now I'll let that soak in, and then I'll wipe it down. Okay, here's what this Craftsman Barlow pocket knife looked like when I brought it home from the flea market. And here it is all cleaned up. I wasn't really going for a, a mirror finish on the blades, but man, they looked like they turned out pretty good, huh? Now there's some scratches along the edge there. That's from the sharpening process. A lot of times what I'll do, I'll put some of that blue masking tape over the blades to protect them while I sharpen. I didn't do it this time. This is going to be my everyday driver and it's going to get scratched up with use anyway. The blades, blades snap close real nice now. Lubricating that spring really improved it. This knife was super dry. Now it's, yeah it's nice. I think that's going to make a really good everyday carry for me. So the short answer is that yes, there was a Mr. Barlow. There is some disagreement on which Mr. Barlow was the Mr. Barlow. 
There was an Obadiah Barlow manufacturing knives in Sheffield, England around 1670. His grandson, John Barlow, began exporting them to America in the mid-1700s. There was also a manufacturer in Stannington on the outskirts of Sheffield making Barlow knives in the late 1700s. These knives may have been named after a Samuel Barlow who lived on Neepsend Street in Stannington. There was also a Barlow Brothers cutlery business in Stannington. The Barlow knife was first mass-produced in America by the John Russell Company around 1785. Russell's Barlows with the arrow through the R on the oversized bolster were rugged and affordable. By the 19th century, Barlow had become a universal term for a style of pocket knife rather than a specific brand or company. I picked this pocket knife up for $5 at the flea market and cleaned it up by hand with basic tools. Vintage pocket knives like this one are fun to clean up and their carbon steel blades are easy to sharpen razor sharp. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching. It turns out that a single Barlow style pen knife may have changed the course of American history not once, but twice. A young George Washington obtained a commission in the British Navy. His mother, Mary Ball Washington, was convinced a career in the British Navy was not the right path for her son and implored him to reconsider. George decided to respect his mother's wishes and surrendered his commission. George Washington's mother presented him with this penknife as a reward for heeding to her wishes and as a reminder to always obey your superiors. Fast forward to that rough winter in Valley Forge during the Revolutionary War. With his men starving and freezing, Washington wrote out a letter of resignation as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. One of his trusted officers reminded Washington of his prized penknife and his mother's instruction to always obey your superiors. Washington decided to tear up his resignation letter and lead his men to fight to the end. And the rest is, as they say, history.